Whether you're making a short documentary or a high budget feature film, all documentaries are made up of the same basic ingredients. And a director's job is to just mix and match these ingredients in different ratios in order to fulfill their creative vision. Today I wanna to break down what these basic ingredients are and how you can use them in your film to elevate your story. If you're new here, welcome. My name's Mark Johansson. I'm a documentary director and editor based in Canada. I've been making documentary films for about five years now, and on this channel, I break down the nuts and bolts of how documentary films are made. If that's something that you're interested in, I'd love for you to stick around, hit that subscribe, and without further ado, let's get into this list. Number one, interviews. Interviews are the fundamental building block of documentaries. It's what separates documentary films from narrative films. The power of interviews is that you're not only using them to give your audience context to your story, to get them from point A to point B, but you're also experiencing all of the story events through your character's eyes. When we experience their story, we're transported into their world and we really connect with them on a deep level. That's what makes documentaries so powerful and so emotionally moving. We feel like we are able to reach through the screen and connect with a complete stranger as they tell us their version of events that are unfolding in their life. Interviews, therefore, are the heart and soul of your film. They're what make your audience connect with your film, and it's what resonates with them once they're done watching and they're out in the world telling their friends. Number two is actuality or A-roll. I don't actually call it A-roll, but I think it's important to differentiate between A-roll and B-roll just because B-roll's kind of gotten its own reputation lately. A-roll is any footage that visually brings the audience through your story events. It's footage that directly advances the plot. Without A-roll, you wouldn't be able to tell the story. It's not just a nice to have this footage. This is must have footage in order for you to properly tell your story. For example, in my documentary Mountain Turks, which is about a community that comes together and builds and installs these plastic water tank huts in the mountains of New Zealand, without the footage of them installing these huts, I wouldn't have a story. I wouldn't be able to tell that story properly. So that is the A roll. B roll, on the other hand, which is number three in this list, has kind of taken its own form on YouTube for anything that's slow mo or cinematic. But B roll is supplemental footage. It's footage that helps tell your story, but doesn't immediately move the story along. So, a great example of this would be any scenics or nature shots or establishers of locations, even something as simple as a cutaway of a picture in your main character house. The power of B-roll doesn't come from the fact that it's cinematic or slowed down or epic in any way. Oftentimes the value in B-roll is that it communicates so much more information through visuals which just would be impossible to concisely convey to your audience using dialogue. For example, if your audience sees that your main character has a photo of him and his family on his wall, you immediately know that he's a dad. You immediately know how many kids he has, that he has a wife. You know that he's probably a family man. You can get a feel for what his interests are based on what he's doing with his kids in the photo. All of this is being communicated subconsciously to your audience. And for you to have to communicate that with interview footage would just take way too long. So B-roll helps add all of this context, this subconscious context that your audience can then pick up on so that they can create the story in their own heads. So when you're out capturing your A-roll, make sure to also capture some B-roll. Look at your surroundings, see what's around you, see if there's any hints or clues as to the location or any information that the audience can glean about your character. The fourth ingredient is voiceover. Voiceover is any dialogue that doesn't have a video component attached to it. You can think of voiceover as being a narrator, or at least that's one use of it. This is your dream, your challenge, your time to step out of everyday life and into the wild. 
oftentimes when you're creating a documentary, you have all of these different scenes or ideas or themes but you don't often have the glue to connect in between them. So it can become hard to transition from these different story beats. A lot of filmmakers will use voiceover in this case. Now voiceover can take on different perspectives. You can have a godlike style voiceover, which is often used in things like Planet Earth by the BBC. This is a tropical forest, a rainforest the richest habitat on Earth. David Attenborough comes in in between scenes to set up where we are in the world, what's about to happen next, and, and what animals are going to be in the scene. Another way that's really practical to use voiceover is if you have a line of dialogue that your character just kind of flubbered on in the interview, they didn't quite say it right, and when you're trying to edit it, you can't clean it up and allow them to say it concisely. You can get your character to re-answer that question on a microphone without cameras playing at all. And as long as it's close enough quality to the original interview that you captured, and you have footage over top of it in your edit, oftentimes your audience won't even know that it's not from the original interview. It was the last night where we were just scratching around getting everything done. You know, this is it. This is our install day. And it was just like this is a great way to help you connect those scenes that you may not have gotten in the interview when you were originally recording. Number five is archival or stock footage. Now, obviously, you can't be everywhere all at once. You can't be capturing everything all the time. And the reality of making documentaries is that some of the events that we're covering happened before we even started shooting. This is where archival footage comes in clutch. Archival is an amazing tool to get used to using in your films because you can get so creative with it. And when you have gaps in your story where you have great audio but no supporting visuals, digging into these archival sources can really elevate your story. Get creative. You know, you can use newspaper clippings. You can go online and find articles. I've even created a cool scrolling animation before with an online article. You can use family photos family video. There's so many different sources, historic photos from libraries. Just get creative. The more creative you can get here, the more you'll just enhance your story. And don't worry even about the quality of these archival sources, because oftentimes there's a lot of tools that you can use to enhance these with different forms of treatments or graphics. Another way to fill some holes or to cover your butt in the edit is to use stock footage. Maybe you showed up to a location and you know that it's beautiful in the fall time and the leaves are just popping with yellows and oranges. But when you went to go shoot the scene, it was the end of winter and everything was still dead and just brown and not that appealing looking. Don't be afraid to go online and dig up some stock imagery. I think stock footage can sometimes feel like a little template-y and gross, but you'd be surprised with all the different libraries out there now. There's so many different sources of incredible footage, especially when you're looking for things like nature shots or establishers of locations. So don't be afraid to dive into archival sources or stock footage because they can really help save your edit and make your documentary way more powerful. Number six is reenactment or pickup shots. Sometimes you just don't have any footage for a particular scene. They may be describing an event where no one was around, there is no news, there is no one who captured it in any kind of way. In this case, it might be worth considering using reenactment or pickup shots to help fill in those gaps in your edits and visually convey the story in, in a creative way, even though you don't have the actual footage. The advantage of shooting reenactment or pickup shots is if you've already been editing your film and you know that you have holes in your film that you're trying to fill, you know precisely the shots that you need to get that'll help sell that scene as best as possible. Maybe you have really moving dialogue from an interview of a mom talking about the struggle of balancing running her own company that's struggling and taking care of her kids while they're being homeschooled. You now know exactly the type of footage that would go perfectly with that audio. So you can set up a fake scene where 
Maybe the mom's sitting down at the table homeschooling their kids. Maybe she's sitting at a desk working on a project for work. And you can use all those shots. You only need like 10 of them. And boom, you have a scene. The beauty is that because the audience has no other context, you can set up this scene very quickly, shoot it in half a day, and now all of a sudden you have all the footage to tell this story visually as well as narratively. Your audience will be none the wiser. They will just immediately assume that you are there right at the perfect time capturing these scenes as they unfolded candidly. Last but not least, number seven, music. I can't overstate how important it is to find great music for your documentary. Music has this way of subverting our conscious brain and hitting us right in the heart. It pierces through that wall that we all put up in our day-to-day -day lives and hits us in our emotional core. And when you find the right track that rings true for you, that's not too sad or too epic or too happy, but it kind of plays in that gray area where you feel the emotions just bubbling up from deep inside of you. Odds are if you're feeling that when you're listening to a track, your audience is going to feel that too. And it's like you're telepathically communicating the emotions you're feeling directly into their heart. Take the time to find great music. It can feel extremely painful. I swear with every project, I'm like banging my head against the wall, searching through all these stock music sites to find that perfect track. And I feel like I'm never ever gonna find a good track ever again. And before I know it, all of those hours of blood and sweat of scrolling through websites, you get rewarded and a beautiful track will just pop up out of the blue and you drop it in your edit and it just elevates your film to that next level. This is Future Mark. I was in the process of editing the video and I realized I totally forgot to include two major elements of documentaries. The first one is sound effects or sound design. Similar to music, the importance of sound effects I don't think can be understated. It is such a useful tool to transport your audience into your film beyond just the visuals. Because your hearing is so closely tied with your emotional processing, when you're hearing environmental sounds or cues, you're brought into the film in a much deeper, more meaningful way. There's multiple ways you can go about adding sound design to your film, whether that's diegetic sound, which is any sound that happens in front of the camera as you're shooting. So that could be an on-camera mic. You could be recording on lavaliers and then syncing it up in post. It's basically any sound that you recorded in the field. And then there's sound design where you're going in in post, you're finding stock libraries, maybe you're recording fully yourself and you're adding it into your finished edit to set the scene or add sound cues to make the audience basically feel like they're living in that moment too. Adding sound design in this way can make your film feel a lot more real and a lot more visceral. The second thing I forgot to mention was animation. Animation similar to archival footage can be an extremely valuable tool in patching up different parts of your edit where you have visual gaps. They can also be an incredible tool for visualizing complex information or data sets. A good example of this is Vox here on YouTube. Some of their graphics, their animation teams are brilliant at taking complex ideas or data and displaying them in a way that just makes intuitive sense. And because you're not just hearing someone ramble off facts, it sticks in your brain a lot more than if you were to just hear a voice or see some boring visuals. You remember not only the animation, but the data itself. I've used it in the past for visualizing adventures and routes. I've used it in vlogs, but I've also used animation in my documentary Mountain Turks to visualize where all of these huts were being put in the mountains. It's just another tool that you can use to help convey complex ideas that are just not the easiest to explain with dialogue. 
Anyways, back to other Mark. And there you have it. That's all of the basic ingredients that go into making a documentary film. I mean, all of the documentaries that you know and love are essentially a combination of all these ingredients. Directors just take these ingredients and combine them in different ratios, similar to a chef making a new recipe. You know, a little bit of voiceover here, a dash of interview here, some music here. Oh, I need to pop in some archival footage. Whether it's for practical reasons or for creative reasons, it's just a matter of choosing these different ingredients and combining them in a way that helps you achieve your vision for the film. If you want me to dive into any of these ingredients a little bit more, let me know in the comments and I'll either answer your questions there or maybe I'll make a video about it in the future. If you happen to like learning about the nuts and bolts of how documentaries are made, I would love for you to stick around, hit that like, hit that subscribe, all that good stuff. And other than that, I wish you good luck with whatever project you're currently working on and I hope you have a great day. Later.